So we're going to start. Um, so before we begin, as always, we want to um, start with our bodhicitta motivation. So just bodhicitta, the definition of bodhicitta is the wish to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. So it begins with compassion when we see the suffering of others and we this natural compassion that we have arises that so we wish that they didn't suffer. And but that is not bodhicitta is not mere compassion. It's mixed with the wisdom on, that comes from the Buddha that understands the cause of suffering, which is um, innate. This kind not innate but um, fundamental ignorance about the law of cause and effect and the nature of reality. And those things, um, in turn, um, are responsible for us. Um, misunderstanding what causes happiness, what causes suffering. And in the pursuit of happiness, we have this habit of um, doing all the things that cause suffering. So um, with that in mind, we understand that as long as we are swimming in the same kind of muddy water of ignorance as everyone else, the help that we can give um, is necessarily limited. So out of great compassion for others, um, we form this strong kind of yearning to attain enlightenment for their benefit that is called bodhicitta. Um, if you are not Buddhist and that's not your, your deal, that's fine. You can just make the wish that um, the time we spend together this morning benefits not only you, but everyone around you as well. And then we always take a moment, too, to um, think of our precious teachers. Um, in our case, that would be Jigme Kensu Rinpoche and Tugu Rinpoche primarily, and also um, Taku Matu Rinpoche, who uh, regularly comes and gives teachings at our center. So um, without them, really, we have nothing, really. <laughs> um, we're so fortunate in our time to have not only these teachers, but the Dalai Lama and Karmapa and um, so many other great masters who are alive in our time who we can go to for um, advice and guidance and who serve in, as an example of what an enlightened being is and who can teach us and help us in our world today so we don't have to rely on, you know, texts from many centuries ago that maybe, um, you know, are not as clear as they might be um, after many centuries of being translated and retranslated. And without the masters there who have realized these teachings, then we can interpret the teachings however we like. So, um, with the masters here, we know that we're getting something authentic and true. So we really feel a great deal of gratitude towards them and also respect. Um, gratitude because um, they're the ones who are really helping us with the greatest thing, which is to um, get out of this mess of samsara or cyclic existence um, so that we can really benefit others. All right, so um, today I want to talk about depression um, because uh, I have depression and um, I have been, uh, I've had it since the age of six years old, um, quite seriously. And also I just saw that yesterday, uh, Yonge Mingyu Rinpoche um, made a video called, I um, can't remember what it's called, something like dealing with depressive thoughts or transforming depressive thoughts in the pandemic. So I provided a link in the description to that. So if you'd like to watch that after this, um, please, please do. I highly recommend it. Um, I, I noticed that it doesn't say depression, but depressive thoughts, that there's a big difference between those two things. Um, I actually haven't watched the video yet, so I don't know what he said. But um, I do know that he is a really reliable uh, and a great master. So you can rely on that. He's trustworthy. So today I want to talk about my experience um, and hopefully uh, my experience 
and the different things that I've used to um, come out of it or to deal with it, um, because I still deal with it. I woke up with it this morning. So I um, actually have been experiencing it this um, whole week. So I'm kind of um, struggling with it. I thought, okay, today's the day to, um, to discuss it because then I'm also teaching myself, right? But Pema Children has this great line where she says, um, teach yourself the Dharma. I think this is really important, you know. We have, um, some of us, received a lot of teachings and um, we can, it's good to rely on others, you know, for for the Dharma, for, to receive the teachings, especially at the beginning. But once we have heard a lot of them, um, you know, we can dig into our own memory, our own mind. We can, you know, look at the text and then teach ourselves the Dharma, meaning kind of, okay, what does the Dharma say? regarding this particular situation, how can I how can I use it? That's also called taking refuge in the Dharma. You know, we have a certain problem and then we look to the Dharma to help us um, deal with that problem. So um, some years ago, I um, wrote this piece that I actually posted on, on Facebook called A Dozen Ways to Avoid Committing Suicide. So, so um, I'm not going to go through the whole piece, but I, I would do want to go through each of these points because um, I think it's very it's very important and and it's really helpful. Some of them are Buddhist related, some of them are not Buddhist related. Okay, um, so uh, the first one is just finding someone to talk to. So this is um, very very important. It's either a friend, a therapist, your dog, just writing it out, whatever it is. And I know from experience that this can be really hard to do because in the state of depression, we have tendency to really not want to do that. By the way, just as an aside, this is not, what I'm saying here is not just for people who have depression, but for everyone. Um, even if you don't know it, you probably have a friend or relative who has depression. So this can really help you to understand what they're going through and how you might help them. Okay, so please um, don't feel excluded if it's not something that is your particular issue, okay? So um, it's important to talk to. So what I started to say was that you, when you're in the middle of that, the tendency is to not want to talk to somebody, okay? You feel like, oh, I don't wanna bother somebody, I don't wanna bring somebody down, or if you're really bad and you're feeling like really suicidal, you feel like, oh, I don't want to scare them, you know, I don't, I don't like that, okay? So I'm very fortunate to have um, a very, very kind sister who loves me a lot and um, who has gone through depression herself, so she knows what it is. And, um, you know, she just was very, very strong about me contacting her you know, and said, doesn't matter time of day, doesn't matter what she's going through, that I should contact her. And I said, you know, I don't want to scare you. And she said, I'm not going to be scared. Don't worry about that. And so, you know, and I've come to trust her for that. And we don't need to be on the phone for four hours. You know, we don't even need to talk about it. Just to contact her, get some other kind of influence, something else in my head besides this depression. Okay, so the second point is you don't, you have to understand that the way that you feel is not the ultimate reality and is temporary. Okay, so what I mean by that is that when you are in the middle of depression, it has this weird um, kind of, um, I don't know, what I have here is a, uh, the most insidious and evil things about depression is that two very awful and very strong switches are turned on at the very same time. Okay. The first says this is the only uh, this is the only reality. And this really feels very strong, right? Any other time that you felt happy was like a joke, was like um just a trick played on you because you're a sucker. It's so strange. But anyway, that that is how it feels. And um and then the second says, this will last forever. The first says, like, this is the only truth. The second says, this is your whole life. This is exactly how you're going to feel for the rest of your life, okay? 
But you have to realize that you haven't always felt like this, actually. Right? You haven't always felt like this. You just haven't, you know, even if you look, even if you felt like this for a week, even if you felt like this for a year, right? You can look at last year, you can look at two weeks ago, you didn't feel like this, or yesterday you didn't feel like this. So what that means is that this is not permanent, okay? That it is not something that will last forever because it already hasn't lasted forever. And just by the truth of impermanence, it cannot last forever. It cannot last forever, okay? So we can't be fooled by this you know, chemical imbalance, this weird sort of um, trick that the that the brain, I won't even say the mind in the sense that the brain kind of wants to play on us that says, um, this is permanent, okay? Um, okay, uh, so, uh, so and, and there's a gap, so we have to look at those gaps also. So even in the midst, okay, of a really serious depression, there will be a gap. If we pay attention, okay, there'll be a little gap. You'll look outside the window and you'll see a lilac and it'll, it'll just bring a little flash of joy. That's a gap. And we can ride that and we can be open to that, okay? We don't have to be... Um, um, loyal to our depression. This is something I learned when I was in my um, solitary retreat for one year and I was feeling kind of depressed. I wouldn't say depressed, actually. I was sort of in a bad mood, I would say more, because there's really a difference. If you've had depression, there's really a difference between feeling blue and being depressed or feeling sad and being depressed, okay? But anyway, I would say I was kind of in a dark mood, sort of in a bad mood. And um, and I was picking uh, blackberries off this bush and it was just the smell of the blackberries it was so gorgeous, you know, and the sun was really shining and I just suddenly felt happy and I pushed it away and <laughs> because I thought, oh no, I'm depressed or I'm feeling bad, you know, like I can't, let that go. I wouldn't, it wouldn't be honest. <laughs> it's so stupid. You know, we don't have to do that. Why? Who, who are we cheating? Please have an affair with happiness. Go on. Cheat on your sadness. Cheat on your depression. And just, you can, you're allowed to. Just drop it. If you can't, it's not always possible. But if that, that gap of joy arises, you're allowed to just drop the depression. Or yes, you can just drop it in that moment if if possible, okay? If not, at least you can use that gap to realize that the depression is not permanent. That's proof that it's not permanent. Just, even if there was just a second, a gap of happiness or joy or relaxation, okay? Excuse me, all right? So, and if you're saying, like, this is the only reality, then, come on. And so what I have here is, um, you know, what is reality? When you find it, let me know, okay? Um, when that switch get, gets turned on in your brain, start to question the switch, all right? Look at the switch. And don't take that question seriously. All right. The idea that your depression is the only reality is weak sauce, lazy philosophy. <laughs> okay. It's not the only reality. It just isn't. But in, in the midst of depression, it really feels that way. The third point is learn to catch yourself when you first start sliding down before you end up at the bottom of the pit because it's much easier to turn things around at that stage, all right? So this is where meditation is particularly helpful, all right? Because through meditation, we start to see 
um, like we start to notice more quickly the small movements of our mind, okay? So uh, before meditation, all right, we don't really notice things. Typically, we don't really notice things until we're like really in it, right? We're, we're sort of, we we're, they have a full-blown attack of anger or jealousy or what have you, but we don't see the beginning of it, yeah? We don't see the, ir the beginning of irritation until we're really angry, right? Or we don't see the beginning of, you know, starting to kind of spin out into depression, those, those initial feelings of depression before we're like how in the bottom of the pit and then we can't get out, yeah? So when we start to, that beginning point when we start to feel like, oh man, I'm going down, right? That's the point if you can recognize that, to start to do things. But the easiest, so you, let's say, you have a much better chance of realizing that if you do meditation, okay? Because through, just like mindfulness or breathing meditation, all right, through mindfulness or breathing meditation, what happens is, right, for probably most of you have done that already, I don't know who's here, but for, for those of you who have already done it, you know this, right, you're sitting, you're focusing on the breath, you're letting the thoughts just come and go, yeah? And through that, you start to recognize that your thoughts are actually just thoughts. They don't have, you don't have to let them control you, yeah? They're just like clouds moving through the sky. So you don't have to be like, um, you know, enslaved by them, right? So that's one thing you notice, and then through, you know, once you get um, more skillful and get more experience with meditation, then you start to notice more quickly what's happening in your mind because you get really familiar with your mind, yeah? So then you start to see, okay, I'm going down into this depression. So that's the time, right, um, when uh, you can make a big effort to turn it around. And that's the time when all the BS advice that people give you, you know, people who have never experienced a minute of depression in your life, in their life, you know, just go for a walk. Why don't you just eat that or just drink a glass of water? Those people, okay, that advice at that time actually works, can work, okay? That's the time when taking a walk, going to the park, talking to a friend, you know, all that stuff can really help right? Because you're not really in the pit. You're just sort of starting to go down, okay? Whatever um, lifts your mood, okay? But wh when you when you do those things, don't do it. Um, but I, I have a lot of swearing in this, so excuse me. But don't do it, I will say, halfway, okay? Don't, don't do it halfway. You know, really do it. Really dive into it like your life depends on it, okay? Because your life depends on it. It really does. The, um, you know, depression is an illness. It's a mental illness. And it's it can uh, result in death. So um, we have to uh, protect our life and we have to help others in our life uh, to, you know, do our best to, to help them also understanding that sometimes the illness wins and there's nothing we can do, okay? All right, number four, if you find yourself at the bottom of the pit, just hang on. This has helped me so, 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 so much. I cannot tell you how much this one thing has helped me, okay? And that is through really contemplating the truth of impermanence, okay? Um, again, right, the truth of impermanence. So at this point, you, all you're doing is hanging on. You're not trying to change anything. You're not trying to meditate. All you're doing is hanging on, just hang on, okay? Knowing that it will change because it must change because everything is impermanent. And so this is also impermanent. Even if your brain wants to tell you that it's permanent, it is not permanent. And what you have to remember at this time is all the other times that you fell in the pit and came out of the pit, OK? 
Okay. So your only job, you have one job during this time when you're in the pit and that job is to stay alive. That's it. Stay alive. If you need to sleep all day, sleep all day. If you want to binge uh, Netflix, do it. But try not to watch sad things. <laughs> okay. All right. If you want to just sit around and eat chips all day, do it. Anything that is going to keep you alive, do it. Okay. Just stay alive. That's it. That's your only job. I cannot tell you how many times I said to myself, my bodhisattva activity for the day is to stay alive. All right. That's my bodhisattva activity. I'm just going to stay alive today. Right. Because what happens is that, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. If we take our lives, all right, it hurts others so, so, so much. Okay. And it never stops hurting them. That's the problem. We might think in the midst of that illness, like, they'll be better off without me. They don't really care. I'm sure they'll get over it. It's fine. I just can't deal with this pain anymore. We might think that, but really it's not true. They just never get over it. You know, I heard somebody say the other day, there's a really good podcast, by the way, it's called The Hilarious World of Depression. And it's like different comedians and um, mostly comedians, I guess. I don't know, I just started listening to it, but I find it quite good. Um, and it's just different actors, I guess, and comedians talking about their depression. And I, I found it really nice, so you might look into that. Um, but um, so all that stuff, like sleeping and whatever else that you need to do just to stay alive, all that is your medicine, okay? All that is your medicine too, okay? So um, just keep doing that until you come out of the pit and then you can get, get back to your regular life. All right. And don't feel bad about that. Don't feel like, Oh my God, I can't believe I just spent the whole day in bed again. So what? So what? You spent the whole day in bed. If you were sick with the flu, right? If you had the flu or you had COVID, would you say, Oh, I feel so guilty for staying in all day. No, you wouldn't. You're like, of course I stayed in bed all day. I have the flu. I have COVID. Or, of course I stayed in bed all day. I have a broken leg. I need to stay in bed. You wouldn't even think about it. But with depression, oh, we feel so guilty. I'm just being lazy. I'm gonna... No, man. You have depression. You're trying to save your life. That's good. Stay in bed all day. Good choice, okay? The fifth point is to take meds. All right? Just take meds. I know that, you know, um, what I have here is it's not a failing, okay? Even if you're a spiritual person, even if you are an all-organic, vegan, chia-eating yoga queen, take meds, okay? This was so hard for me, so hard for me. You know, I kept thinking like, oh, but, you know, I'm a Buddhist nun and like, I should just be, I should just practice through it, you know, and I should just be a good practitioner and I'm not a good practitioner if I can't deal with my depression. No, sorry, no, that's bull. That's not true, okay? It's not true. Would I say that if I had diabetes? I don't, I don't I shouldn't need a, insulin. I'm a, uh, I'm a good practitioner. I should be a good practitioner. I shouldn't need insulin. So stupid, you know, it's not stupid, but it's because in our culture, we don't have this, we still don't have a right understanding about depression, okay? We just don't. We don't have a right understanding about it. We're still very judgy about mental illness in general, okay? So we, others judge us and we judge ourselves. So I, and not all medications work. You know, and sometimes you often you have to try this, try that, try the other thing, you know, try combinations, you know, find a good uh, therapist, whether they can prescribe or not, and find a good, um, they don't have to be the same person, you know, 
find a good psychiatrist who can prescribe. Okay. And if you find natural stuff that works, go for it. You know, sometimes there's natural things that work for people. I'm not saying you have to go the allopathic route. All right. But don't feel bad about needing medicine for it. It really works for a lot of people. So I, I encourage you to go that way. Okay. All right. All right, I'm just going to keep talking about this because I think it's important, even though we're running out of time a little bit. So, all right, so number six, please think about those you would leave behind. They never get over it. Oh, yeah, that's what I started to say earlier. So this person, <clears throat> I think it was on that podcast I mentioned, they said that um, one of their family members shot themselves, and they said that... Um, uh, um, that they felt that that bullet just kept ricocheting, just kept ricocheting and kind of affecting every single other person in their life. You know, it really is like that. So we, we have to think about that. Okay. Then my, se my seven point, okay, maybe it's, not, maybe it's not the most practical, but it's get a damn dog. Okay. <laughs> That's my seven point or any kind of pet. Maybe you already have a dog. I don't know. But I did not have a dog before. And I really noticed that, like, having a dog was so helpful for me. You know, I live alone. And I live when I got my dog, I lived in this apartment building. And um, it only had, like, 19 units. But I didn't know anybody. You know, you guys know how it is. You don't, people in general, like, don't really know their neighbors. They don't know people in their apartment building. I knew, like, one or two people. But after I got my dog, like within a week, I knew everybody. Also, when you're depressed, you have a tendency to isolate yourself and sort of just stay inside, stay under the covers, draw the blinds, you know, this kind of thing. But guess what? Your dog needs to go outside. So you have to go outside, okay? And your dog needs to walk. And so you have to walk. And then your dog brings people who want to pet him and talk to you about him. And so suddenly you're like socializing where you would not normally socialize. The other th cool thing about a dog is that unless the person is really bad and your dog starts to growl at them and stuff, they're really non-judgmental, which I found very, very helpful. You know, they would go up to people that I would normally be afraid of and, excuse me, and just be really kind and loving. And then that person's like l gentle nature would come out and I'd be like, wow, they're really nice. You know, who would have thought this person who looks like a biker or whatever, you know, would be really nice. So um, that was very help helpful. Plus, I mean, come on, they're so cute. And like, you can love them and they love you. You can, you know, they give you affection. Like my dog's like a, also like just a, as I'm sure those of you who know, um, who, who have them, he's like, like a little therapy dog, you know, like this more, like he's just been clinging on me today because he knows that, that I, I don't feel well, you know? So, um, yeah. Okay. Plus they make you laugh every day. All right. So then the end of that is just get a damn dog people <laughs> and get a rescue. You save a life and that dog will save yours in return. All right. So here's some advice that uh, Tuka Rinpoche gave me because I talked to him a lot about this problem. Um, so this is point number eight. He said, you think it's better over that wall, but you don't know. It might be worse. So this is a common thing, right? Either we think, oh, you know, sometimes people think like, oh, when I die, like, I'll just kill myself, and then, like, I'll go to heaven. Like, some people think that, okay? Or I think, I don't know, or sometimes people think, like, um, you know, I'll kill myself, and then everything will be over, you know? And, like, that would be the end of it, right? But actually, we don't know that, you know? We don't know that it won't. Maybe it will. Who knows? But we don't know that it will. It might be worse. That's what Ripuche says. Yeah. He says, you know, you do you think it'll be turned off like a light? Maybe, but maybe not. 
You don't know. And you could be setting yourself up for suffering that is a lot worse than what you're going through now. So we need to think about that too, you know, because we really don't know. Excuse me. I have to just blow my nose. Sorry. Make sure I'm off camera for this wonderful event. Hold on. Oop. Okay. Okay. All right. Then he says, and this is also true, if you commit suicide, you will inspire others to do the same. And this has been borne out by studies. Um, do you have friends, family, acquaintances that are also on the brink? Do you even know who might be? Don't give them another reason to do it. So people do find this, as I said. It's been shown in studies that, you know, when someone kills themselves, it does inspire others to do the same. So then we're kind of responsible for others also, which is not so nice. Okay, then he said this freaking brilliant thing because he's brilliant. It's not your body that's the problem, it's your mind. So why punish your poor body for a problem in your mind? Makes sense, makes perfect sense. Then he said, number 11, people often regret committing suicide when it's too late. Okay. And again, this is not just Rinpoche, like this is borne out by studies. They did studies, so there's a lot of people that, as you know, jump off the Golden Gate Bridge to commit suicide. And some of those people miraculously survived that jump. Every single one of them said that the moment they let, that they jumped, they re regretted it. They regretted it, okay? So Rinpoche said, imagine that you're on a boat in the middle of the ocean and you start to destroy that boat, okay? There comes a point where you can't put the boat together. Then at that point, if you regret it, like it's too late, yeah, the boat is destroyed. Then how are you gonna feel? How are you gonna feel, okay? So we need to think about that too. We need to kind of consider our certainty that, um, this is a good decision because we know the outcome. Like we don't know the outcome. We actually don't know the outcome, you know, either way. We don't know that it's like just turning off a light. We don't know that it's something good. We don't know that it's something bad. We don't, we don't know for sure. So why do you want to really take a chance with that, right? And then from a Buddhist, point of view, which of course you're free to accept or not, committing, uh, well, actually they said it's this word like committing suicide is, um, they prefer to say completing suicide actually. Completing suicide means that it will take eons upon eons to get another precious human life or a human life at all actually. So from a Buddhist perspective, like, that's really important, yeah, um, to have a human life at all, but especially to have a precious human life. So precious human life is something that takes a little bit to explain in detail, but in essence, it means a human life that has all the uh, conditions necessary to be able to study and practice the Dharma um, so that one can attain enlightenment. So already to get one of those is extraordinarily rare um, and for all those conditions to come together. So the typical example given is they say it's like um, a blind tortoise swimming the seven seas and who only comes up once every hundred years. And then on the top of the seven seas, there floats a golden ring just here and there, you know, and the chances of receiving, of getting a precious human life are the chances of that tortoise coming up every once, every hundred years and his head landing in the middle of this golden ring. Or usually they say yoke, like an oxen's yoke. Yeah. So it's so rare. So do we want to, you know, really like make that even harder to get? Like, maybe not. Yeah. So um, 
there's also, so what I said was, you know, I mean, these are the main points. I, 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 I will just give you that. Like, these are the main points that for me has really helped me all of these years. You know, I've been, as I said, uh, essentially, well, let's just say clinically depressed since the age of six and wanted to commit suicide at the age of six. And now I'm 58. So that's 52 years. Okay. And I have been practicing Buddhism for 32 um, years. Okay. So that's a lot of experience of keeping myself alive. Okay. Of dealing with this particular issue. So um, that's what I'm trying to share with you. So hopefully that you also find that helpful and that that can help you in your uh, times of distress and difficulty. Um, I also, I have this link. Um, there's a really good link. There's a really good, which I did not put in the description, but I'll try to, um, I'll try to put it in um, later on today because I have to edit this video after, but the site is captainawkward.com and the article is um, how do I reach out to my friends who have depression? It's a very, very good article. Um, let me just put it in the, in the chat so you can uh, have a look at it. Hang on. The site is... Uh, Captain Awkward, it's a pretty good name, I think. Awkward.com. So that's the site. And then look for how do I reach out to my friends who have depression. Okay. All right. All right. So um, I hope that you found that helpful. Um, this is really the basis of um, what I have found helpful um, over the years. So, all right, so it's, let's do some meditation. Okay, we only have 20 minutes. So I want to do a little bit of mindfulness of breathing practice. And then we're going to do the practice of exchange using ourselves as the um, focus. Okay. So let's begin with um, just some basic mindfulness of breathing. So, <clears throat> so we want to first just take the posture. So if you're in a chair, you want your feet flat on the floor. If you're on the floor, just cross your legs in whatever way is comfortable. So palms down on your knees, palms up in your lap, or with your fingers on top of each other and your thumbs touching like that. Okay, Arms relaxed. Back is straight, main point, that's the most important thing is that your back is straight, okay? Back of your neck is also straight, so your chin's gonna be tucked in just a little bit. Sorry, I gotta drink some water here. Mouth is closed, but relaxed. Tongue resting on the roof of your mouth, breathing through the nose. The eyes are open, looking down half. So just take a second to notice the breath coming in and out of the nose. That's going to be the focus of your awareness. So the meditation is going to be trying to maintain awareness of the breath, letting the thoughts come and go. Not trying to stop them, push, not trying to push them away, not judging them. Just let them come and go. Keep your awareness on the breath. If you get distracted, it's really no big deal. Just bring your mind back to the breath, okay? I'll ring the gong to start and also to finish.
Body should be as relaxed as possible while maintaining the posture. Your mind should be as relaxed as possible, very spacious, while maintaining awareness of the breath. So your awareness shouldn't be really tight or tense, you know, just you're aware of your breath, you're aware of the sounds, you're aware of your, you know, where you're sitting, right? Mostly aware of the breath, not losing, um, not being distracted. There you go. Okay, now we're going to move into the practice of exchange, otherwise known as Tonglan. This is another really good practice to do if we are feeling, um, uh, uh, if we're feeling depressed, it's really good to do this practice. So what we're doing is we're doing Tonglan for ourselves. So it's a way of um, developing compassion for ourselves, which sometimes we lack when we have depression. Um, another good thing from the teachings uh, is that when we're feeling really bad about ourselves is to remember that we have Buddha nature, that we have basic goodness, okay? Um, this is also very helpful because we can feel quite miserable, okay? So I'm not going to explain the practice. I'm just going to guide you through it So because we don't have a lot of time, all right? So we're going to begin by just resting the mind. So that's different than trying to focus like we just were. Just going to like just settle the mind, okay? So I'm going to ring the gong again. Just listen to the sound as long as you can hear it and let your mind rest, okay? Okay, so now imagine in your heart center, so that's just the middle of your chest, a very bright white light like a shining star. Now consider that you're breathing in gray smoke, hot, dark, and heavy through all the pores of your body. Every particle of that smoke dissolves into the white light in your heart center. So there's not a single particle left, there's only light. Now consider that you're breathing out white light through all the pores of your body. Cool, clean, clear, very bright. OK. 
Okay. Now imagine yourself in front of yourself facing you. Okay. So in this practice, the you that is meditating is the part of yourself that's completely in touch with your innate Buddha nature or your basic goodness, your innate wisdom and compassion. Okay. And the you that you are visualizing is the part of yourself that is confused and in pain. Okay. So the first thing that you want to do is to look at yourself as you would a beloved friend or relative, someone that you love and admire. Without embarrassment or discomfort, um, really see all of your good qualities, okay? Your kindness, your good heart, intelligence, your sense of humor, your whatever, whatever you are good at, you know, how you try your best every day to fulfill whatever roles you have. And if you see any faults in yourself, you know, see them like you see the faults in those you love. And you don't expect others to be perfect, right? You love them despite their faults, sometimes because of their faults, right? Allow yourself that same generosity towards yourself. Then consider the way or ways in which you're suffering, and you know that better than anybody. Physically, maybe you have some kind of physical difficulty, maybe you're sick in some way. Mentally, emotionally, maybe you have depression, maybe you have another kind of mental illness, maybe you're lonely and angry, Maybe you're addicted. Maybe you're worried about the future or money problems. Whatever it is, you know. And just consider that for a moment. And then generate deep and pure and real compassion for yourself. The wish that you be free of all this suffering. then consider that all of this suffering that you're experiencing takes the form of gray smoke, hot, dark, and heavy. It leaves the visualized you, it comes to the meditating you. And you breathe that in through all the pores of your body. And all of that smoke dissolves into the white light in your heart center. Until there's not a single particle left there's only light. And then you offer yourself every happiness, everything that you need to feel better, along with the wish that you attain full and complete enlightenment in this very lifetime. And all of that takes the form of white light, cool, clean, clear, very bright. And you breathe out this white light through all the pores of your body. And when the rays of light touch the visualized you, you see all of your suffering just completely disappear, just lifts off of you and disappears. And you see yourself just breathe a great sigh of relief. You look really happy and bright, energetic and healthy. And the meditating you feels joyful for being able to do this for yourself. Now we turn our attention to all sentient beings, first visualizing them all around us. In front, as many beings as we can conceive of, stretching all the way to the horizon. Same to the right, all the way to the horizon. Behind, all the way to the horizon, and to the left, all the way to the horizon. So now we're surrounded by countless sentient beings, all the way to the horizon in every direction. And we consider first our connection to all of these beings. And Buddha taught that each one of them has been our kind and loving mother. 
in at least one of our countless previous lives. We don't have to accept that if we don't want to. We can just contemplate the fact that we're all so similar and that we all want to be happy. We all want to avoid suffering, yet we all suffer to one degree or another. We can consider our connectedness. As we see with this pandemic, we're very, very connected. We can also consider how we rely on each other. Tukur Rinpoche is very fond of bringing this up. How really we can't get through a single day without relying on others. Those who grow our food, who make our clothing, who provide electricity, our utilities, who made our, wherever we live, you know, our transport, the, you know, so many things, right? We like, especially Americans, like to think of ourselves as rugged individualists. Well, sorry, no, we're really interdependent. So, so think of all of them with some sense of gratitude and connectedness. And then we consider whatever kind of sufferings all these beings are going through. Some of it extraordinarily intense. And so we consider that all their suffering, whatever it is, takes the form of gray smoke, hot, dark, and heavy, and it leaves all of them and it comes to you. Without any hesitation, you breathe that in through all the pores of your body, every particle of smoke dissolving into the white light in your heart center. Until there's not a single particle left, there's only light. Then you offer all of these beings without exception, your own happiness, your own good fortune, along with anything at all that they may need to be happy, healthy, to feel better, and adding to that the wish that they attain full and complete enlightenment in this very lifetime. All of that takes the form of extremely bright white light, cool, clean air, light and weight, and you breathe that out through all the pores of your body. So very strong, very bright, going in every direction as far as the eye can see. So you really you're like the sun just going in all directions. And when these rays of light touch all these beings, each individually, their suffering completely disappears. It just lifts off of them and disappears like fog in the morning sun. And you see them all just breathe a deep sigh of relief. They look so happy, joyful. And you feel joyful for being able to do this for them. Now you let go of the visualization altogether. It's gently bringing the mind back to the breath. Focusing on the breath. Bringing the mind to the present moment, here and now. Okay, so now we're going to dedicate the merit. Those of you who know the prayer can say it with me. One of these days I will remember to put it in the description, but for now, I'll say it once in English and once in Tibetan. By this merit, may all attain omniscience, may defeat the enemy, wrongdoing. From the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, from the ocean of cyclic existence, may I free all beings. So nam di jam bani. Tugne ni pe dranam pam jeshing, ke gana chi balon trupayi, 
Si pezzo de joa joa sho. Un penso saggio se mi ama no pane ya faccio se fa tenu pa ti ti do no joa su do pane mi va su do pane mi va no a tu mi va se se de mi pezzo sa ka me su che me che da mi shi yang guru hun. Ha 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 ho ba ga wan sa ta ta ga ba ma ba ba ma ma sa sa no. All right. So Uh, thank you for joining me this morning. Um, remember to watch the video of um, Taku, of Young, sorry, Young Gimme Grimbache in the description. I have a link there for you. Um, and we have time for questions if you have any questions, but I won't wait long. So if you have a question, better ask now. Thanks, Dave. Any questions? Here's me not waiting very long. No questions. Okay. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great day. And some of you all see, you'll see this week. Some of you all see you next week. So have a good week. And please stay alive. The world needs you. Okay. All right. Bye. <laughs>